What's good everyone? It's your boy Salos back again with another Monster Hunter World video. And let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something. This is, I think, the first time I've been able to genuinely talk to you guys since last year. So I just wanna first off just say, just apologize that I haven't really, like, I know that I've been sitting on this stockpile of recordings and I feel so bad about it, but so much came up, so much, so many un unforeseen things happened. Uh, when the holidays came out, I was working overnight. I was trying to help get management under control at my job. I was doing things with my family, um, things with my friends came up un unexpectedly. So I just haven't really had much time to really sit down and just make videos. So. I have been playing Monster Hunter. I pretty much have been, have been playing, playing Monster Hunter every single day. You guys fall, um, have me added on PlayStation, and yeah, you guys have hopped. So I've actually played Hunt and Hunter with some of you guys, which has been, a, which has been just been such a cool experience that I was just, it's just been so cool to play with you guys. And yeah, you guys can add me, um, editor sales. If you could put my PlayStation ID on on right here, you guys can add me on PlayStation if you so so desire. Well played me in real time. Room's always open. I'm always down for a fourth hunter. We're all down for a fourth hunter. But honestly, I really, I really have just missed talking to you guys because I know, I know we talk through the comment sections, but there's just such a large gap between where I am in my current journey in the world and where I am in terms of content on the channel. And I've tried my best to make light of it. I even tried to mirror like a Shippuden arc where my old hunter was like the old me and with my new look, my more refined builds that this was supposed to be like my Naruto Shippuden look and how the time skip has made me a better person, a better hunter, more seasoned, more veteran. And trust me, I'm gonna lean more into that. Just wait till you guys see when I'm actually gonna get into like the Alatrion stuff and things that come out after that. Trust me, you guys will see quite a bit of leaps in my gameplay because let me just tell you, I've been playing Monster Hunter every day since since the Safi Jivo. And you know the old saying, the more you do something, the better you get at it over time. But no, seriously, I really have just been trying my best to up my content, to up my game, and to just make make it so that I, I never want to take you guys' kindness and patience for granted, especially the Monster Hunter crew, because this, the last couple of years on this channel has been grounded by Monster Hunter. I know I, I do Pokemon stuff. Pokemon has always kind of been helping the channel in the background. That we've done Fire Emblem stuff. We've done now Grand Blue a little bit, but Monster Hunter has always been the basis. And I always want to take care of the root and the foundation because without the foundation, everything else falls apart. So I feel like Monster Hunter is here to stay. Monster Hunter will always be here to stay. It's, it is very quick, one of my favorite video game franchises of all time. So I just want to let you guys know that I that I, I truly do greatly appreciate you guys. But we didn't here to get here all sappy and, and uh, sentimental and stuff. We got, we're here to talk about the greatest raid of all, Safi Jiva. If you guys are new around here, then I always say that there is going to be video to watch. There is going to be gameplay to watch. But I feel like that these videos are best enjoyed if you just kind of Put it on the background if you got any any um, babies to babysit, if you got any homeworks to do, you got anything to clean up around the house, you got some some you got with some weights, uh, do your workout, cook dinner, whatever you do in your daily life, it's best to just kind of let this play in the background and then just go out your day and listen to me talk for a little bit, even though I'm kind of under the weather because of pollen because pollen season actually sucks i hate spring so much because i am deathly allergic to pollen good god but we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about Safi jiva so if you guys are enjo enjoying it and you guys like discussion videos I, I ask you now more than ever because youtube is being a little finicky with its algorithm it's kind of crapping in on itself so youtube's not really pushing things around as it should so if you guys could just like the video, share it out, and make sure you're subscribed. I never ask this type of stuff. I always say that if you like the video, then like the video. But if you guys could go the extra step and just make sure you're subscribed and just share around the video with some of your friends, it would mean a, the world to me because 
yeah, YouTube's kind of um, crapping in on itself. So I would appreciate if you support the boys, support the dream, but enough self-promotion. Let's get into this the discussion video, shall we? Now, let me just say this about Safi Jifa. I didn't know when I was going to fight him. I didn't know how I was going to fight him. I didn't know how he fit into the story after the credits rolled, after he slayed Sharish Valda. I thought that maybe Safi G would have been the final boss of Iceborne, but apparently he's not. And that just confused me because it seemed like Safi G was just a natural pick as the final boss, right? Xenojiva, the baby form, was the final boss of Base World, so why not make Safi G the final boss of Iceborne? It just made perfect logical sense to me. But. Uh, I still don't know how I feel about him just being thrown in out of nowhere, but pop off, I guess. But now here's something that I'm a little confused about. Maybe the Monster Old Heads can help me out on this one. But is Safi Jiva a black dragon? Because here's what, I, here's what I've heard about black dragons. That black dragons is pretty much, I won't say it's a fan term. But it's kind of like the word Voldemort, where it's so feared and it's so reserved that they don't speak it because it's just it's just something that's understood, but it's never told. Like you will never see the term black dragon in a Monster Hunter game. But the way you know that a black dragon is a black dragon is when their power is so immensely incomprehensible to the human mind that you cannot believe that something like that can exist. That is what de defines a black dragon. Is that true that there has never been a sense in Monster Hunter that there has never been lore or a text description or anyone in the, in the guild that's, that's even spoken the word Black Dragon? Because if that's true, that fits the description of Safi Jiva. Because I've heard Safi Jiva is a Black Dragon, but every time I hear him referred to in the game, they call him an Elder Dragon. Same thing with Alatrion. I know Alatrion is a Black Dragon, but still they don't call him a, a Black Dragon. I'm just a little confused on the whole terminology, so if one of the old heads can actually clarify that for me, that would be very much appreciated. But for the terms of this video, I'm going to say that Safi Jiva is a black dragon. And let me tell you why. I say that he is a black dragon because he fits that description of mold of what a black dragon is. A black dragon is a, is a monster whose power is so immense that its control is so massive and it's so earth shattering and breaking of the laws of physics that you cannot believe that something like that exists and i'm a little sad that i wasn't able to get i'm not sure when i had this reaction but when i had the i had the realization no 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 i think it was i think it was recorded i think it was recorded or was it i don't know anyway when the moment you found out that Safi Jiva created the, the Guiding Lands. All the amalgamations of all of the, the biomes in base world, that he created that. He can create realities, ecosystems. He can create environments, biomes, all living together. That, that was a mind-boggling revolution to me, that Safi Jiva created the Guiding Lands. This, this entire place we've been grinding in, that was his creation? And that's not, a, that's not a black dragon to me? I mean, that's not supposed to be a black dragon? I don't know, dog. I just think that that kind of confirms it for me that he is a black dragon. But whether he is or isn't, what we can say is that I feel like it is a very satisfying conclusion to the Xenojiva arc. Because when we fight Xenojiva, then I, I know that there's also Arch Tempered Xeno Jiva that didn't really fight on the channel, but maybe we'll go back and fight it just, just to say that we did it, even though we're probably just gonna pop him. But the fight with Xeno Jiva just felt it's literally like coughing baby, the coughing baby meme, because you very much are beating up on a newborn. He's kind of just, just fighting off of instinct. He's he just hatched. He just got his, found his way in the world, and we're here to kill him. The only reason we didn't die to him on impact 
is because you know, Jiva didn't know what it was doing. It was flailing around. It couldn't control its own power. It was explosions everywhere. But you could very clearly see that even all that raw, unfiltered power was still enough to level that entire area we were in. So the thought, the prospect, that if something like that didn't had time to mature, had time to cultivate its powers, hold in on its powers and learn how to use them, what could it be used for? And we got that answer in Safi Jifa. And man, could I have not been more pleased with the result. Because if there's one thing in video games that it always irks me, let me tell you something. It always irks me when you fight a video game boss. It doesn't even have to be a video game boss. Or it's a, whether it's a playable character, whether it's an ally, whether it's just um, a final boss. It doesn't matter what it, what it is, okay? Whenever the lore does not match the gameplay, it always takes me out of the element. Every single time. So I just... I am just so appreciative that Safi Jiva actually lived up to, to his reputation. And just sticking with the Xeno Jiva to Safi Jiva comparison a little bit, when Xeno Jiva does, does his beam attacks, they're wide, they're sweeping, they're powerful, but they're unrefined. It's, you can block them, which I, I think you can block them. They're slow, they're not as fast, they're easier to, to block. Safi Jivas are refined. It's a thin beam. It's so concentrated. And it, it, as my friend DP said it, it's like Shin Godzilla when he's using his atomic breath. It's concentrated and it's focused. It's narrow. And the beams that are those wide sweeping beams, it's a concentrated beam that he charges up and shoots at you in bursts and burst shots. You can definitely tell that Zero Jiva has had time hasn't had time to really master his powers. But Safi Jiva has been molting his skin, has been refining his power, learning how to best use them. And when you see what it can really do, man, we haven't even got to what you, what, how, how much of a mastery of the, over the energy that he really has. But I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let's take this one step at a time, shall we? So let's start with the recon mission. I feel like it's a very good way to, I know that that in actual real life events that the recon mission came as a teaser as they got the raid ready and that was like your way to get a taste of what to come for the full raid it was kind of like a way to demo it kind of like how you got to fight demo malzino or demo magna Malo, or i think there's a demo nergigante for world but it's the same sense of where they get you get to fight the monster before it's actually time to release and i feel like i think that it was shadow dropped or something I think that the main that the main show was Digits and Ogre, and at the end you got that cutscene of the, hinting at uh, at Safi Jiva. And yeah, looking at it from the lens as a teaser, I think that did its job magnificently because I think that it very it very efficiently sets up the tone for what the first and second phase of the fight is going to be like. And I think this is the perfect transition to the to the actual fight itself because if I were to describe the whole fight in one in one word i would use the word theming because that is what this fight is either the or the theming or pacing but i think that both terms still apply because can we just talk about the soundtrack for a second because it starts with that eerie with that eerie chasm feeling where it's like a sense of dread and mist and mystery where it kind of erupts and crescendos up as it's going. Not really the best when it comes to musical terms, but it starts very low tone and it starts very dreary, like you're you're almost scared to find what's at the end. But then it it has that that iconic simple sailor theme to it that erupts into a confident I can do this. But that's just that's just the intro cutscene. Then when the fight starts itself, that's when you get the choir and the, and the orchestra and everything going in it. And that's when the fight first begins. And I almost get a vibe where it's kind of like, I don't want to say it's, a, it's an Undertale moment because 
I wanted to say that it almost feels like an uh, Undertale moment where Sans is like, I always wonder why people don't start with their strongest attack. It's not like that because he doesn't start with the Sapphire of the Emperor. Or as my friend uh, Bug likes to call him, Sapphire of the End, but whatever. But um, yeah, it's not really that he starts with the strongest attack, but he's, he starts at full throttle. It's kind of, this is, I always love when video, when video games do this because it sets up the tone for spoilers for the rest of the fight. He's, he, he attacks ferociously and he prepares you for what's to come, but you don't even know you're being mentally trained for that. I always like to use the example of Mega Man X because I think that Mega Man X level design is probably the best design in video games that I've seen because usually the way Mega Man X levels are designed is that they will present a danger to you. I'll use an example. I'll use an example. I know it's Mega Man X, but this is more of the Zero games where it's, it's, if it's in a forest area, right, then there'll probably be an obstacle that if you, that there's a, there's a chasm or there's some type of pit in the road that if you fall, you'll fall to your death. And there'll be a latch that you can use your grappling hook to swing over. Very simple, you know, just swing it over, swing it over a hole, no big deal. Then, they'll, then there'll probably be something in the terms of a power-up or an extra life, or there'll be something that'll be out of your way that will give you an opportunity to test your ability to, not, without putting any stakes, there's still a solid floor beneath you, but there is a t there is a chance for you to test your abilities at wall clean or or grappling or swinging on this on platforms to get an extra advantage, whether it be an extra life or be an extra power up or um, in the in the X games, it'll probably be one of the one of the um, X parts, one of the X upgrades from Doctor Light, whatever it may be. It's there for you to practice on what the game has just told you that, that will come later in this level. Then there's like the medium section of the level. There'll probably be instead of one hole in the road, there'll be three holes in the road. So if you if you chose to take that optional route to practice, then you know what? Swing, swing, swing. No, no big deal. And then at the very end of the level, before the boss comes, there'll probably be enemies that are shooting at you. Now, as you're swinging, you have to time your swings because the enemies are going to be be attacking at certain moments. So you have to be fast with your swings. You have to be precise. You can't take your time and think, okay, do I need to build up some momentum? Do I need to... No, you just gotta go. And there'll be enemies swinging at you. There might, there might be some pitfall traps and spikes at the, at the end of the chasm. And then that's right before the boss. That, I think that's, that's a very safe way to do level design where it presents a danger to you in a very safe and controlled environment. Then it gives you an opportunity to practice that that what you just learned about the game before the game throws everything in the kitchen sink at you at the very end. And that's very much what this what this first phase does. It sets up that Safi Jiva it 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 doesn't really spoil anything, so to speak, but it does show you that Safi Jiva it, sh it shows you his base moveset very well. Whether it be the charging laser attack, whether it be the sweeping Shin Godzilla atomic breath, or whether it be a charging attack or whether it just be random charges. He pretty much shows his, his entire moveset in the first phase of the fight. And it's, it's, like I said, it's in a very safe and controlled environment. You have, you have uh, rocks in the, in the um, level that you can topple on them to kind of interrupt him. There are vines that you can get stuck into that will give you burst damage. There's a lot, of, the, the first area very is a safe area where you can use the level to your advantage to kind of swing things in your favor. And, the the song is still is just playing that it's this uh, who's laughing now? Zulu says who? I'm not I'm not singing this correctly at all. But you guys know what I'm saying, right? It's just such a cool feeling, and the song just perfectly matches that, and. I think I talked about the first level enough, but then you then you finally get to repel him a little bit. And after he's drained all the energy from the first level, he ascends deeper to find more energy. And he knows that he Safi Jiva is a very smart creature. He knows that that you're trying to get him to drain all the energy in the area so that he can't heal anymore. And you can finally get, get to get the killing blow on him. So he starts to amp it up a little bit. This is where you get the realization. This is where you start to, to actually get the sap this um 
what is it? The um, Sapi Jeeva's Ire, I think it's called. But that's when, it's, when it gets the chance to actually target a player. And that is, I don't know, Sapi, Sapi Jeeva's Ire is such a weird mechanic because I always hear mixed, mixed receptions on it, but here's my personal take on it. I think it's an ingenious way as theming, like I've been saying, theming and pacing are the perfect words for this because I think that that these bosses, at the time of this recording, I have not fought Face Hallis, so I do I cannot confirm this, but this is just my suspicions about what I've seen the game has done up until this point. That it's training offense, and sorry to pick on you, Bug, but I'm gonna use my, my friend a bug here because he's, he's one of the people in our hunting groups. We all are, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, so this isn't any fault to him. But his one of his um, one of his weaknesses is just being able to push the offensive because he's very he's a very defensive player. I don't want, I don't want to say he's passive, but he very much holds his ground. He very much likes to stand and deliver, wait for an opening, and then punish, which is why I recommend a great sword for him because that's literally what great sword is. It's literally a bait and punish weapon. So. He's kind of found some ground in that, but he's found he's definitely found his stride in the insect glaive. But Safi Jeeva really challenges you to go beyond your limits. And it's not really to the extent, and I say that I think that it's training you in the same way that the that the pacing is, because the immediate next fight you fight is a Latrion. And a Latrion, you have a DPS check. And not just a DPS check, you're on a timer to meet that DPS check. You have approximately six or seven minutes to meet the DPS check. And being that you're on a timer, if you do not meet the DPS check, it's an instant one shot. And if you're in a party of four or you're in a party of three, that's a game over. So it's not to that extreme just yet with Safi Jeeva's ire, but it's, it's mentally training you to stop attack because the way the Safi Jeeva's ire works is that you have to constantly hit the monster. You have, to, you have to hit it enough to keep his attention and you have to do enough damage so that he can keep your attention. He doesn't lose interest so that your other party team members can go for the go for the siege rewards. Whether you need to break a wing, break the back, break the tail, break one of the hind legs. It's so that your team, you're literally giving your teammates an opening or giving your teammates a breather so that they can do the damage while you're just keeping his attention. And it's mentally training you for to to keep going and push your offense because when the last round rolls around, you would have mentally trained yourself to keep going, keep pushing because once you understand that Latrion has a DPS check, that once that clicks in your mind, you're like, okay, I gotta go on the offensive, and that theme, that theme of offense with Asafi Jiva continues to play out, and like I said, it's not right to the extremes of a Latrion. But this is a 20-minute siege, so you don't have all the time in the world of a 50-minute hunt. You still gotta, gotta move and hustle. But I say that is not as extreme because there is no punishment. If you don't hold, hold his attention, it's no big deal. You can still continue with the siege. You're not gonna lose the quest. But it does give you a massive advantage. If you're able to hold, hold down the fort for your team, it puts you in a such better position to break parts or to topple him. Or to go for their strategies your teammates want to want to implement. So I think on that level, the Savi Jeeva's ire is pretty much ingenious. And speaking of ingenious, can we talk about that final phase? Because when the music drops, it's just oh my goodness! all the yelling right there because my throat is actually in agony right now but I, i'm gonna have to talk lower for the rest of the video holy crap but the point stands i feel that final phase that freaking final phase is nothing short of genius everything you've learned in every phase from the falling obstacles from the first phase to safi jiva's ire i didn't even talk about sapphire the emperor but that's just such a display of just one little droplet, one concentrated drop of raw, pure energy can level 
an entire chasm. And it's kind of like a Guy's McGorn situation where you really have to stop and think. If this thing wasn't in the secluded valley, if this thing gets into the real world, what can this do to a civilization, to a town, to a village? And that is why, because a Sapphire of the Emperor is probably one of the most devastating attacks we have seen in the Monster Hunter series. That attack alone, I feel, puts Sapi Jiva in the Black Dragon category. On top of everything else we know that he's implied that he can do. That is why I feel he is a Black Dragon. But back to this final phase. It is everything you've learned up until this point. It is using the environmental damage to use the crags to explode after you use the Sapphire of the Emperor. It's hiding behind the crags to make sure that you don't get blown to smithereens from Sapphire of the End. It's using Sa Sa um, Safi Jeeva's ire to even, if you're smart enough, to lure him towards the environmental damage so your teammates can blow him up with the gas caskets. It is everything from every phase, from the first phase for environmental damage, to the second phase with Sapphire of the Emperor, to the third phase with super critical mode where he's basically one giant tenderized his entire body becomes quote unquote tenderized but his damage is doubled he's faster he's stronger he knows that he's on his last legs and he is fighting with every fiber of his being with every energy pulsing through his veins to make sure that he is the one who stands on top to, to make sure that you know that he is the sapphire emperor that he is the one who's going to come out at the end of the day and you will be the one to know why he is the emperor and why you are his prey it is a duel to the the death and there's been nothing like it in monster hunter i'm looking at you raging bracket diaz you ain't got nothing on this fight i said it in the video and i will say it here i have been looking forward to this hunt all game there is a reason why asafi jiva's theme is the theme that i use for the intro of all my videos for the iceborne series there is a reason why i chose that song it is because i have been looking forward to this the entire time and it did not disappoint on any level. From the power level of the monster, to the lore of the monster, the ecology of the monster, the setup to the fight, the fight itself, and the rewards which we will get to because oh my gosh, there's a lot to unpack with those rewards. Nothing about this fight disappointed. And I, for one, think that this is going to go down as one of my favorite monsters in the entire series. And I know it might be a while for him, for him to come back because he is an entire siege monster. But when he does come back, I will be awaiting for my rematch. And I know our fight will be legendary. But holy smokes, we've talking about the rewards. What do you get for beating the Sapphire Emperor? You get one of the most customizable weapons in the entire game the Safi weapons and I, I know that if you look at any guide out there they'll pretty much all say the same thing that it's the sop is Safi weapons or go home and that's because the Safi weapons are probably some of the most customizable weapons in the entire game you need thunder weapons he got you you need status elements he got you it doesn't matter what you need, there's a soft weapon that will fit your need. If you need it to be elemental based, he got you. You need it to be probably less focused on element, more focused on sharpness, sure, no problem. The only thing that I will say is that people act like the soft weapons are the only weapons you, can, you should consider, and that is just simply not true. Because there are still indications, there are still situations, there's some monsters and some matchups where the soft weapons may not be the best pick. I'll use Alatrion for example. Alatrion is all about elements. You need to do elemental damage or go home. And the king in that case in elemental damage is are the Kulf Tarop weapons. Because Kulf Tarop has a little skill called critical element, which basically amplifies all of your elemental damage. And that's going to help you significantly being that DPS check. Will do on average, do the Safi Jiva weapons do more damage? Probably. I'm not really a math guy. Uh, I took a calculator risk on a lot of these fights in the world, and let's just say I suck at math. So, um, maybe I'm not the best to talk to you about numbers, but if I were to just go with my gut and just by just how the weapons feel, 
I'm pretty sure that nine times out of 10, the Sokka Chief weapons might be the better overall in terms of just doing damage if you build them correctly. However, on when you're going against monsters like Elatrion, who doesn't really care about your raw damage or raw based, uh, base values, and element is all that really matters at the end of the day, then yeah, Cold Sroth is going to be better all the way. So I say that if you want a very comfortable weapon that fits your playstyle more, the Safi Jiva weapons are probably going to be the last weapon you'll ever consider. But if you look at raw, um, well, I think you, I think anyone playing knows who the best raw weapons in the games belong to. But generally speaking, they're not bad weapons. And the one thing that really sets them over the edge is something I haven't even talked about is the fact that they can have any armor bonus in the game. You need Volcanus Frostcraft? No problem. You get Volcanus Divinity on on the on the actual Safi Jiva armor because manifestation, manifesting your reality. That's Safi Jiva's whole gimmick. The only thing I will say though is that you can't stack them. You can only you you can only have one one armor bonus per per Safi weapon. So let's say that I want to use Volcanus Divinity. If I want to use if I want to use Frostcraft, I don't have to wear four armor pieces anymore. I only have to wear three because the weapon will count as one of the four armor pieces required. But I still need to wear three pieces of Volcanus armor to get Frostcraft. That's kind of how it works. That it's, it's still kind of bounced in that sense. That it doesn't give it to you for free because if it did, good God, what game is this monster on a rise? But it still is. It still does give the top two weapons a little bit more comfortable flexibility. That... If you want a weapon that you don't really think too hard about and it's perfect for build for build flexibility because it opens up your armor skills to you're not you don't feel as restricted as as locked into different weapons and different armor skills that you don't have to wear four out of five pieces for Volcana's gear. Now you only have to wear three pieces, so you could wear that that really good. You can probably now you can do things like to have Frostcraft. You can wear the Safi Jiva armor, three pieces of Volcana and two pieces of Raging Brachydia, so you get both Frostcraft and you get and you get Adversary Secret. A very powerful combination. That's just one example of what you can do with Safi Jiva. Really, the sky is the limit, and it's just a matter about how much grinding you can do because you have to basically play through the raid more to unlock the weapons. I'm not gonna talk about all that here because um, that can be a whole video for itself about that. There are very good guys out there. I'll probably link, link a few in the description if you want to know exactly how the Safi Jiva weapons work, but just know the sky's the limit and the only limit really is your imagination. This really is for people like me who likes to get down, get messy and get creative. That is why I love these weapons because they allow for build flexibility. And that is what I strive for. I love making builds. I love, I have probably four or five rows of just builds from both my charge blade and dual blades just all set up because I just love building builds. I love theory crafting. I love making move sets in Pokemon. I love making builds in Fire Emblem. It's just what I live for. So this is, this armor, these weapons were made just for me. And we had to talk about the armor because good god that armor now with my rise background you know i have to compare it to the skill dereliction dereliction is the armored skill associated with the final boss of monster hunter rise sunbreak guys mcgorn and basically how that skill worked that very much leans into the, the scroll systems that is in that game pretty much um scrolls you can think of them kind of like um what were they called back in back in generations Hunter Arts, yeah, there we go. Basically, all weapons have a pre predetermined list of of weapon skills that you can use, but you can only take so many of them into battle. So it's kind of like Pokemon in a sense, where Greninja can learn a can learn an array of moves, but Greninja can only take four moves into a battle. Does that make sense? And does that make sense a little bit? I'll use a more practical example with Charge Blade because I think that's probably the best sense to use because I'm because I've been on this Charge Blade journey. So let's say that you have they have skills that are tailor made for the super amped element discharge play style, or they have skills that are more towards guard pointing. So let's say I want to make a play style that's that I don't I don't really care about the, the um, axe style. I just want to be the best sword and shield 
charge blade user I can be. I don't really care about the transforming aspect. I just want to use Sword and Shield 2.0. There are skills that can improve your guard pointing. There are skills that can instantly fill your file so you can charge your sword more. And it leans into that Sword and Shield playstyle. But now, when you, when you swap skills, let's just say that just, just for mobility's sake, let's say I want to lean more into the Savage Axe style, or as the proper name is, Power Axe style, which, <laughs> or what is this called, Savage Axe? Let's, let's be honest, it sounds so much cooler. And you can then swap your skills. So now that all those skills that were catered towards guard pointing and catered towards filling your files so you can keep your uptime on your, on your sword and shield, now that it can be used for a savage axe you can have more build more mobility with your axe you can transform faster you can have new moves that are only accessible when you're in the savage axe play style you can have both those play styles to you and you can swap between them on the fly that's essentially what the scrolls what the scroll system is and the way dear Lich interacts with that system are that when you're in the red scroll i believe actually let me pull this up to make sure that I don't make any oopsies Yes, the red scroll, when you're in your red scroll, that's when you have increased elemental values. When you swap to your blue scroll, that's when you have more raw damage. So it doesn't matter which one, um, on if you're if you're more towards an elemental playstyle or more of a raw damage playstyle, if it's it caters to both playstyles. And you go up to plus 30, I believe. You get plus 35 to your to your raw. Plus 35 raw when you're at max with a skill, and you have plus 20 element to your to all of your elemental damages. So yeah, it's a pretty nice and sizable boost. Kind of similar to the Safi Jiva armor. The Safi Jiva armor grants you the skill Dra Dragon Man Awakening or True Dragon Man Awakening. We'll use True Dragon Man Awakening because usually if you're using it, you go all five pieces of Safi. And the main difference between the two is that the is that Dereliction drains your HP at a fixed rate versus the Safi Jiva armor drains your HP every time you swing your weapon. And both can be offset by if you by in different ways. For Dereliction, whenever your HP gets a little bit too low, you can always swap scrolls and it'll reset all your bonuses, but you also get all your HP back versus the Safi Jiva armor, once you've hit the the, the, web, the monster a certain amount of time, then you'll get your heal back. And if you if you can keep the pressure and you're very good at dodging, eventually you will out heal the, the amount of damage you take from the armor bonus. So it really does reward aggression, in which again, it just keeps pushing the narrative that Safi Jiva is pretty much teaching you how to be offensive and aggressive, then you're rewarded with tremendous power and healing. Like, it sounds great in practice, but if you falter, if you let the monster stagger you, or you keep get, you get hit and you're stunned, then you're actually going to be losing more HP than you're gaining. And at that point, it really isn't worth using. I will say that both have their pros and cons. Pros being that Safi Jiva has a higher ceiling and a higher potential of damage, and because it gets pretty nutty. I believe the Safi Jiva armor get, with True Vein Awakening gives something like... 20% affinity and on top of more of I don't even know how much how much elemental damage it gives but Pretty much the Safi Jiva armor grants a whole lot more than Dereliction However, Dereliction has the comfort of whenever you feel scared or wherever you need uh, you, you feel like you're losing too much HP You can always swap scrolls and you can always get all your HP back So there is that insurance with Dereliction where it's not a higher risk, but it's more it has a bigger safety net so not really, it's really irrelevant because they're not, they're not in the same game, but I still thought it'd be interesting to compare the two because that's what it immediately reminds me of. I will say that the Safi Jiva armor did take a little bit of, of adapting to get used to because just, especially in playing a Savage Axe play style, because Savage Axe is your most damaging play, player style for your for charge blade, but you also lose access to guard pointing and shielding which really makes you an open target to the monster so you really have to learn iframes but luckily the sop jiva armor comes with some pretty amazing skills on it you have you have life resistance which is very important for the immediate next fight coming up you have a little bit of evade window you have a little bit of of critical boost it's it has a lot of very unique skills and very good passives that make the armor 
function and it really gives you those late game skills that you really want. It even gives you a little bit of a vade window. The Safi Jiva armor really does have pretty much most of the late game skills that you really want in the armor with, with pretty decent slots to boot. So overall, it is a very good armor. I don't want to say that it's probably better than the Raging Brachiodeus armor because I think that Agitator is still, in most cases, a very consistent skill and, you, and it's very much for people that probably don't want to focus, focus on HP management and like I said, it gives you that flexibility to play defensive if you so choose. But the Safi Jiva armor, if you're highly aggressive, if you're balls to the wall, go big or go home, this armor is like will fit like a glove to you. If it's like if I die, I die. This is probably the only armor you'll ever consider. Mine is another one in that sling with dark, but we'll get to that when we get to that. But if you're more defensive, if you don't really like committing that hard to offense and you like flexibility, you like to you like to play defensive every now and then, you like to wait for your openings and take your shots as they come see fit, then maybe something like the Raging Racket Diaz armor will be will be better for you. But overall, this is definitely one of the best armors in the game, and arguably one of the best armors in the series. Now for the rating. I think that I've spoken enough about the hunt itself. What can I say? I'm really, really, really trying not because I really hate giving 10 out of 10s, but I honestly cannot think of a way to improve this. I'm Because if I can think of a way to improve it, that will give it a 9 out of 10. But I honestly can't think of a way to make this raid any better. It really was a perfect experience for me. So I have to give it a 10 out of 10. I hate I, I don't want to say I hate because that's a strong word. I really don't want to give it a 10 out of 10, but I can't think of a reason why I wouldn't give it a 10 out of 10. The, like I said, the the lore around it is just so amazing. I love the, the concept of energy, just the blue aesthetics from Xenogiva still being present, but it's more, with, it's more internal than external. Just doing that mastery of his power and putting that on full display with the Sapphire of the Emperor. Oh, the hunt itself was just so good. The, the progression, the theme, everything about the hunt. I cannot give it anything but a 10 out of 10. That's what my heart says. I stick with that. It is a perfect 10 out of 10 for me. Now, when it comes to the weapons, this might be a bit of a hot take, but I will give the weapons an 8 out of 10. Only because it is a little bit RNG dependent. You can't pick what element you can. You can, you can manipulate. It's not like Kof Taroff where it's completely random. You actually can manipulate what weapon you get because before you go talk to the quest giver to redeem your rewards, whatever weapon you're currently equipped with, you're guaranteed to get at least one of those weapons as a reward. So if, if you're using Charge Blade, whenever you talk to the quest giver to redeem your rewards, you're guaranteed to get at least one charge weight if you're wearing a charge weight when you, when, you, when you go to accept the rewards. But it is still RNG reliant, and I really, it really can be, that really can be, you can get everything you need on your first attempt, or you can get everything you need on your thousandth attempt. It really is just very grindy in na nature, and to fully unlock the weapons, it does take a bit of a grind. You have to do the, the raid multiple times, and being that it is one of the only the only quest that still rotate up until this up to this day it's if you don't get any, everything you need on, on your first attempt you have to wait two weeks for Safi Jiva to return and that can be a little bit time consuming a little time sinking if you can't do it within that certain amount of time then it's it's not really accessible and I know this is probably probably a minor aspect but for speedrunners they don't consistently have access to these weapons I don't know. I feel like the weapons are very good if you are able to max them out, but it is such a time sink investment versus to just go to any other weapon tree. And like I said, there are instances where there are better weapons out there or weapons that are just as good, if not better than the Safi Jiva weapons. So for that, I give the weapons an 8 out of 10. The armor, however, it really is up to personal preference. And for that... I don't know. I've seen a lot of armors, and I have very consistently heard that the Safi Jiva armor is up there. Probably one of the most insane skills. I mean, one of the most insane armor skills in the series. And I can kind of see how. Affinity and element, just by being aggressive, it does lean towards a very specific type of playstyle. That's not going to fit everyone's glove. 
But for my personal playstyle for dual blades and just being charge blade, it really does fit my own personal playstyle of aggression. And I really do like the fact that it challenges you to become better and, do, and to become aggressive and to come out of your shell and to show the monsters that you're capable of. So, I don't really know. I don't know. I think that for that, I don't want to give it a... Because there is a downside, but just because there is a downside, does that mean that you don't give it a 10 out of 10? But you can offset that so easily because there are so many instances, even in a challenging boss fight like Elatrion, I have offset the damage I take because of the healing, just because I, I have learned the, the fight so much. The more you learn a fight, the more you do a fight, and the better you are at the game, it really is trivial. You really can't trivialize the, the downside, the, uh, the better you are at learning how to attack patterns and reading monster patterns. So, I don't know. I... Uh, I... Screw it. 10 out of 10. I don't care. I'm giving it a 10 out of 10 because that... Because the payoff is just that powerful. I have never seen a, a skill in Monster Hunter that is as powerful as True Vein Dragon Awakening. That skill is just bonkers. And if you can really master it, you can hone into it and just lean into that playstyle, the rewards are astronomical. So I give that a 10 out of 10. So overall... I think that averages out to approximately nine and a half out of ten. I think that pretty much, I think that I perfectly encompasses how I feel about this. It's not quite the perfect raid for me, but it's pretty darn close to being a perfect raid for me. So I think that a nine out of ten being the mean average for all the different factors, I think that's pretty fair. So overall, this raid is a nine and a half out of ten for me. I love this raid. I think that is worth. I think that this raid alone is worth the price of admission to Iceborne, and this alone satisfied me playing the DLC for. I am so hyped that you guys got a chance to see it. I am so hyped that it's recorded on the channel. There should be an I card in the top right corner if you want to see the raid for itself, how that played out for me in real time. Because some of my reactions to this are just golden and priceless. I personally myself, I want to say that all the views on that video. Probably about 10% of those views are me because I've rewatched it quite a few times now. But I'm just very proud of how that video turned out. I don't care how the algorithm says. I don't care what the algorithm says. That is my favorite video of the whole Iceborne series. Both in Base World and the Iceborne series. That is my favorite video that I've recorded up to this point. And I am so glad that it's recorded on this channel that I can go back and look at this for years and years to come. But with all that being said... I think it's about time I finally get up out of here because this is probably the longest discussion video that I've had up until this point. <laughs> Holy crap. So yeah, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to get out of here. I'm about to get some sleep. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Till then, deuces.